Okay, so ready, everybody? Okay, so we we'll start. Okay, good morning, afternoon, evening. Hola, hello, bonjour, hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, annyeonghaseyo, and hello, all. Welcome and thank you for joining us, the 26th seminar and Boston University Day. I just came back yesterday from San Diego, where I attended ACS conference and met a lot of Simbis people. It was so nice to see all of you eat together, chat with you, discuss science and engineering, and also life, and have fun with all of you, looking at the ocean and enjoying a lot of sun. I felt as if I am in heaven. I will <laughs> travel total three months this year, including many European countries, Canada, Korea, Mexico, Israel, and UK. Of course, one of the today's speakers is from UK to give talks and discuss ongoing collaboration in person. Finally in person, I'm super excited. For now, back to the reality with almost freezing temperature and rain and dealing with the too many deadlines and social problems in St. Louis, unfortunately. Okay, it's my tremendous honor to introduce very briefly our pioneer speaker, Professor Mo Kali at Boston University. He is Dolph Ebner, Distinguished Associate Professor of Biomedical Engineering. He received numerous awards, I cannot miss all of that, including very recently 2020 Banner Var Bush Faculty Fellowship, one of the most competitive awards. And when I visit Boston University for my seminar last year, he showed the famous Evolver platform, which makes automation a reality. He has published so many top journal articles, of course, a research article, many of them, and including visionary reviews and perspective very recent, recently in Science and Cell. And most importantly, he is a father of four kids. So very productive in both science and life. With that, Mo, the virtual floor is all yours. And thank you okay. so much for joining us. Oh my God, thank you so much, Taesuk. Um, thank you for that really kind introduction. And more importantly, let me just start by thanking Taesuk for organizing this just incredible uh, event and opportunity that you know, seeks to connect synthetic biologists, uh, young, established, senior across the world. Um, wa watching the videos on YouTube and especially watching the extraordinary work and vision of the early career scientists has been a real source of joy and optimism for me. And I'm, I'm really excited to hear from Michael today. So thank you. Um, in, um, in an unfortunate series of events that I think we can all relate to, I had computer issues this morning that led to the deletion of my carefully crafted presentation. So um, I am attempting to do this uh, without slides and from memory, so, so sorry about that. Um, but um, the first thing I really wanna do is I really wanna take this public opportunity and public forum to add my voice um, to the many, many that are condemning the invasion of the Ukraine, uh, to express my solidarity with the people of Ukraine who are, I mean, unfortunately experiencing atrocities and nothing short of a crisis. So let's hope for a peaceful resolution soon. Um, I, I wanted to take these five to eight minutes or so and kind of maybe talk about three things, okay? Um, the first, I thought it might be interesting and maybe useful to share uh, an abridged version of my trajectory to where I am right now. Um, uh, maybe this provides some lessons or insights, but kind of maybe more importantly, my goal is to debunk any myths um, that we quote unquote established folks have it all figured out, okay? Um, so I was born in the Middle East and then fast forward, very abridged. I went, I did my undergraduate uh, studies in California where I studied um, engineering. And um, this is the first point in the timeline. 
I was very interested in science and I wanted to work in research and I sought out a research position in a laboratory <clears throat> my freshman year. And very promptly, I was brought into the office of my PI and fired <laughs> um, for, you know, basically not being very productive. And this is quite embarrassing because I was effectively, you know, um, a free undergraduate and, um, you know, fired. And so, uh, you know, a little bit discouraging, but I didn't let that discourage me too much. I, I went on to study engineering and I, I focused actually mostly on prob kind of classical problems of engineering, like rocket propulsion and space physics. And at the time, my father actually experienced some, you know, non-trivial medical and cardiovascular complications. And, and this kind of motivated me, you know, from a personal standpoint to go to grad school and, and start to focus on problems of in the biomedical space, in the biology space. I came out to Boston um, um, <clears throat> and began working in this area of biomechanics of arteries and the cardiovascular system. I had wonderful mentors, but um, the problems, um, the scientific problems in that space just really didn't speak to me personally and didn't you know, inspire me and wake me up in the morning um, the way that the problems I'm working on now do. Um, and, and so you know, I was at a crossroads at this point um, I had a lucky break when I got to know Angie Belcher, who is a professor at MIT, um, and her work. And, and just to summarize kind of the main thesis of, of that work in the lab is really the idea of trying to encode into like viruses the information necessary to assemble materials, inorganic materials, right? So now you could make, tell biology effectively to make nanowires and things like that. And this sort of programmability of biology was absolutely fascinating to me. Um, I kid you not when I say I had zero molecular biology, zero cell biology experience, but I went for it. I went and I met with her and I pleaded to join her lab. Um, and um, miraculously, Angie took a bet on me and took a chance and brought me into the lab. Um, and I'm you know, eternally grateful for that because that gave me sort of the foundation. For my postdoc, I took this programmability to the next level. I wanted to sort of begin to think about programming cells now. And I got a chance to meet the, you know, the one and only Jim Collins and to join his lab. I, I understand that we may be in a, he may be giving a talk right now. And so we're sort of competing with, with him for airtime. <laughs> um, Jim was a really an extraordinary mentor. He, and, and he continues to this day to push me to think really ambitiously about my science. And this is something that, uh, I, I, that stays with me. Um, so a couple things to just extract from that. Um, there's no single trajectory, right? Paths are certainly not linear, okay? Um, second, try new things. Um, you know, sometimes it pays to be blissfully ignorant, like I was, having zero molecular biology experience up to basically into getting into midway through my graduate career, right? And this can, I think, put you at a in an advantage sometimes by trying, you know, out of, out of the box things, okay? And then lastly, of course, you've heard this over and over, but it's so important, find and cultivate good mentors and collaborators. The people around you are absolutely critical and will push you every day if you find the right people. Okay, second part of this talk, I thought I would tell you a little bit about our lab's work and, and um, where we're headed, okay? Um, so we have been really interested and fascinated with the idea of using synthetic biology to sort of dissect molecular circuits, right? And understand their quote unquote design principles. So, so we like to take this kind of build to learn approach quite seriously, where we sort of build fully synthetic, uh, you know, genetic circuits, put them into cells and study their behavior. And we focused on doing this, you know, to study gene expression circuits because they're fascinating, first of all, and they generate extraordinary levels of phenotypic diversity. So we have been doing that for many years and, and quite productively. Um, in the last, I would say five years or so, we've become interested in taking some of these ideas and discoveries and translating them into you know, new therapeutic modalities, right? Applications in human health. And I don't have to, I think, tell you that we're really experiencing a revolution in medicine where we have gene and cell therapies providing entirely new ways to address complex diseases, you know, the poster child being, of course, the CAR T cell, right, um, for cancer immunotherapy. So my lab has been really interested in the idea of using synthetic biology to reprogram therapeutic cells, augment their capabilities, make these therapies safer, more potent, more controllable. And I have to tell you, I have been 
overwhelmingly surprised and humbled by how quickly these advances have been sort of translating and making an impact. And in fact, you know, some of the platforms we've recently developed that are just emerging through publications are actually already, you know, some of them being slated for clinical trials in the coming years. So I'm humbled and just excited by the potential and impact for synthetic biology in the human health area at the moment. Um, and it's gotten us to think more broadly, you know, you know, if we're seeing this amazing impact already in human health, can we now point the tools uh, of synthetic biology to other big problems, right? We have, you know, you know um, arguably much bigger problems to deal with like climate change and sustainability. And my lab is thinking actively about this. Okay, so the last thing we do is we develop technology such as the Evolver platform that Tesa um, uh, mentioned to you. And this is the idea of making new types of automation and scalable tools to you know, basically allow researchers to evolve proteins and cells in the lab in, in new ways. Um, and, and we kind of entered this area by taking inspiration from what we've seen in other fields, like how DIY and open source tools have transformed areas like robotics and software. And we wanted to ask, could we kind of learn these principles and now apply them to experimental and laboratory hardware, and in particular to lab evolution. So that was sort of the, the dawn or the, um, um, the birth of the Evolver platform. And we're really excited about applying Evolver to kind of evolve and generate new biomolecules for many, many, many applications. Okay, just one more minute. I just wanna finally in my talk, advertise Boston University as a wonderful community to do synthetic biology. It has historical significance. The genetic toggle switch was developed here by Jim Collins 22 years ago now. I'm part of a wonderful center called the Biological Design Center, um, which is broadly kind of using synthetic biology to address many problems. And for you young researchers out there, we just launched an NIH PhD training program called Synthetic Biology and Biotechnology, or SB2. Um, and we're using it as a platform to train multidisciplinary thinkers, to train the next generation of biotechnologists and to provide you know, young researchers both scientific skills, but also professional skills. So look it up, SB2, Boston University. We'd love to work with you. Um, thank you so much for the time. Taysuk, thank you so much for the invitation. Michael, looking forward to your talk. Oh my goodness. I mean, wow. So thank you so much for inspiring talk and amazing insight. And I now realize we should call today Jim Collins Lab Day with two fantastic talks here and Imperial College, both virtually. Oh, by the way, I mean, Mo, I mean, your dad is okay now? He's okay now. Yeah, he's okay, okay now. Thank oh, you. thank God. Thank, thank you very God. much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so also, I mean, you know, as you said, I mean, of course, I mean, we need to stop the madness of the Russian invasion as soon as possible. Um, you know, there are many, many other problems, including COVID and a social problem, but this, you know, one more, you know, war kind of make the world kind of miserable. Also, I mean, of course, I mean, completely agree with you as a person who miraculously recovered from many years of dying. I believe therapeutic, I mean, of course, I mean, the climate, you know, crisis and so on is an important problem, but of course, therapeutic is very important. And I believe because of the young people we have, also the pioneer like you, synthetic biology will solve many problems in the near future. So thank you so again for your wonderful talk. And I'm looking forward to seeing more fantastic work from your lab and also from other you know, young people. Thank you so much, Mo. Okay. So now the main speaker of today with a longer introduction, Michael Booth is a brand new lecturer, in other words, assistant professor in organic chemistry and chemical biology in the Department of Chemistry, University of College London, UK. So congrats, uh, very exciting you know, new adventure. So before this exciting new adventure, he was a group leader and Royal Society University Research Fellow in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Oxford in the UK. And actually I will visit both universities 
in July this year to give some seminar, and he carried out his PhD at the University of Cambridge, another famous university, under the supervision of Professor Sir Shankar uh, Balasubramani, developing sequencing technology for modified cytosine bases. He then worked in the group of Professor Hagan Bailey at the University of Oxford as a postdoctoral researcher and junior researcher, research fellow at Merton College, Oxford. At Oxford, he developed light activated DNA technology to control cell free protein expression within synthetic cell. He has won several awards, including the 2015 Scoff's Early Career Researcher UK Award in Biochemistry, Genetics, and Molecular Biology, and the 2019 Biochemical Society Early Career Research Award for Biotechnology. This seminar is given in the most exciting time of his career, of course, and he's looking for new lab members. So young people in this audience or you know, YouTube in the audience, if you want exciting science and life in London, apply now for his lab position before it's too late. Great opportunities do not last long. Mike? The podium is all yours now. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're looking forward to your wonderful talk. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the invitation, Tessa, and organizing this, this whole symp uh, symposium. It's, uh, it's been amazing. Uh, and thanks, Mary, for, for, for talking as well. Uh, I echo the sentiment about the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine as well. Uh, okay, so let's try and uh, share my screen. Please tell me you can see this. Excellent. Pointer and a laser pointer is a, is there? Excellent. Okay. Thanks everyone for coming and and and, and listening to my talk. So we work uh, uh, as as uh, as Tesok said in in London now, uh, but we also have some people still in Oxford. So so we're a bit between between places at the minute. Uh, all the stuff you'll you'll hear about is, is work we've done at Oxford. Uh, and I'm going to talk a lot about stuff that isn't published yet uh, that we've been doing as a new group uh, since 2018. So, so we work mostly on nucleic acids. Uh, I'll explain a bit on the next slide how broad that is. Uh, but this talk's just going to be on the more synthetic biology side of, uh, of cell-free synthetic biology in terms of cell-free expression in synthetic cells, uh, which we find really interesting. So uh, nucleic acids, uh, there's lots of different types of nucleic acids of which I don't, many of you will, will know of all of them. Uh, so they're absolutely critical to modern biology. Things like plasmids, siRNA are used all the time just for studying biology. Uh, things like promising therapeutic modalities, whether a, a siRNA, whether it be antisense oligos, or as everyone, uh, most people have been injected with now, mRNA. Uh, but there's also things like CRISPR, which is coming along as well. Those are really exciting future possibilities, uh, mostly to do with this, this synthetic cell, cell-free, aptima. There's lots of all, all sorts of interesting ways of using nucleic acid, which, which haven't been fully uh, developed, which is, is one thing we're hoping to do. And so this is what I'm going to talk about today. So, so what is a synthetic cell? Right, so most people in synthetic biology work on living cells. Right, that uh, have all, all sorts of uh, lots of different pathways, which we don't necessarily even even know what they are yet. And so, what is the the journey to synthetic cells? So that there's there's a couple of different ways that people try to make synthetic cells, uh, non living or well, that's a separate thing. But starting from a starting from a living cell, so people, for instance, in the Ventnor Institute, have been working from a top down approach to try and reduce the complexity of living cells to the minimal type of complexity you can get. Uh, and there's obviously a lot of steps there to then making something which is 
which is very minimal, I think. And there's also people working bottom up, for instance, uh, Jack Shostak's group working on really uh, proto cell type species, which are very, uh, uh, very basic, uh, but really exciting work. Uh, and so we kind of fit in the middle along with a lot of other people that are trying to make uh, partly complex systems, but are completely bottom up and every single component can be switched in and out. And so one way people do this uh, is to use combined cell-free protein synthesis with liposomes. Uh, and you can generate these cell-like systems with very minimal complexity. Uh, and yeah, these are often referred to as snake cells. So what is cell-free protein expression? All it is, is just going from a DNA template to a protein without a living cell. So there's a number of ways of doing that. So this example here is from the original paper for Pure Express, which is a, a purified version of all the proteins and reagents required to do transcription, translation, energy generation, amino isolation. Uh, but you can also do this just with lysates from cells as well. Uh, and, and we're doing both. Most of the stuff here you'll actually see is with, is with Pure Express. And this is also known as in vitro transcription translation. So, so cell-free print expression is used for a lot of things, but I'm gonna focus mostly today on synthetic cells. And so, as I explained to so you, have liposome technology, so a lipid bilayer with a DNA template, a cell-free expression system that can then generate a protein. So this in situ protein synthesis inside a, a giant unimella vesicle normally, uh, uh, according to the template that you insert. So people have used these already for a lot of really interesting things. For instance, communication between synthetic cells, so cascade reactions within or between and multi-compartment stuff, which is a, uh, some of the stuff I'll talk about as well that, we've been, that I've worked on before. But also things in terms of communication with living cells. So for instance, with bacteria, uh, communication and, and detection and killing, even with mammalian cells in terms of delivering therapeutic proteins or even uh, differentiation of neuronal cells. And it, these normally work in one of two ways. Normally either you'll be generating a membrane permeable small molecule, which can then communicate with living cells, or you'll use a membrane impermeable molecule and have the generation of a membrane pore so that that leaks out. So there are a number of limitations with snake cells at the minute. Stability is a big one because obviously these are just vesicles, so they're they're not they're not got they've got a limited lifetime. Right over 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 time, they won't survive. There's also a very limited number of mechanisms of communication, specifically for working with living cells. Right, there's very few methods that have been demonstrated where you can communicate between a, bac a, bac a bacteria uh, or a living cell uh, and a synthetic cell. Uh, and also there's things like targeting, which is really important for the future, right? So you reduce things like off-target effects and in in vivo system, systemic toxicity, if you can actually use them for any application. And one thing, so this targeting is what we are working on in the group. Uh, and we believe that targeting will actually help the other two areas as well of limitations, because if you're targeting, it means it doesn't matter if you don't have as many methods of communication because general ones will be become specific by targeting them. Uh, and also stability, if they don't last very long, it doesn't matter because of the fact that if they're not activated, then they're gonna cause no trouble. Uh, so we, we think targeting is a really interesting and useful way, uh, thing to incorporate into the cells. So we don't do all of our targeting with light, but this is where we started. And this is all the work I'm gonna talk about today is with light. So light is, is an amazing stimulus. It's got great spatial precision. It's biocompatible, it's bioorthogonal. Uh, and even with longer wavelengths of light, you get reasonably good tissue penetration. So the, the technology that I've developed uh, re revolves around blocking a promoter with proteins through a photocleavable linker. And so here you can see this is the structure. So we have the DNA promoter with a photocleavable linker and a biotin strept avid. So all here you have is a lot of protein that just blocks the promoter from being accessed by the RNA polymerase. And then when you shine light, it then cleaves uh, back to 
relatively unscarred promoter, which then allows the transcription translation. So one of the advantages of the, of the way that we do it here is we don't uh, block the Watson Crit Franklin base pairing site. We, we work off the base pairing site. Uh, and this allows uh, us to use double stranded, single stranded, all sorts of different types of nucleic acids. And as I show you later, you can modify them before and use them in PCR as well. Uh, and what's also nice here is it's a one step reaction. Uh, so you can start, you can buy DNA that has amines in and react it with a single molecule, which will then incorporate the fred cleavable biotin. So this is how easy it is to make. Uh, you'll start with a DNA. So this is just a, a HPLC profile. So it just shows uh, the, the oligo here uh, with the UV, with the uh, absorbance trace. And so what you can have is you can buy this DNA with amines in, you react it with this molecule, you, you get majority of the right product, you can then purify that very easily through this uh, uh, HPLC. And then you can just use that directly in PCR to amplify any gene of interest. And then just add the strep David in and you've got your light added DNA and you're ready to go. So this is a, a model put together by one of my students. So here you can see the DNA in purple with seven biotins around it and then the strep davidin protein. So you can see just how sterically crowded and blocked this promoter is. So this is, this is how, how well it works. So again, we've got this. Now what we've got here is an M venous pro, uh, DNA encoding for an M venous pro, fluorescent protein with a T7 promoter that is blocked uh, by the strep davidin. So what you can see here on a, on a gel of the DNA, you can see that the increase in size of the DNA once it's bound to the strep davidin and you can see it cleaves back to the original DNA when you shine light on it. This is ultraviolet light. So what you can then do is you can put this DNA into a cell-free transcription translation a protein synthesis system. And what you can have is you can have a really tight off state where very little protein is expressed without light. But as soon as you shine light, you then get a really great expression, which is very similar to the, if you didn't have it in the, have, didn't have it in the first place. So both the tight off and the good on is really important for, for future applications. So I'm not gonna go through it in much detail here, but a lot of my postdoc work was working on synthetic tissues, which are based in oil. Uh, so these are the uh, multi-compartment structures. So these are droplets in a lipid containing oil, which form a monolayer uh, of lipid, and then you can bring them together to form a bilayer. And so here, you can, uh, this, is, this is technology developed by Professor Hagen Bailey in Oxford. So you can 3D print these droplets into uh, all sorts of interesting structures. Here's just a cuboid. And you can, each droplet can then contain the light of DNA and a cell-free protein expression system. And if you don't shine light, nothing happens. No protein gets expressed. You can see the, the line profile here. Whereas if you shine light, you then get expression through all droplets. And obviously, because this is light, you can then just pattern this. You can shine light on specific droplets, right? So you can make uh, pathways or, as everyone does, smiley faces. But also, you're not, uh, you don't just have to do fluorescent proteins, right? So you can do pore proteins. So alpha hemolysin is a, is a membrane protein well used that forms a specific size pore that you can move current and small molecules through. And so here, what we did is we expressed light activated channel through this, where only the channel expressed the pore proteins. So you can put electrodes on the end and you can get a, an electric charge, uh, a current, sorry, only through this pathway, not off the pathway. I, don't, I haven't shown the data for off the pathway. Uh, but now we're not using those. Now we're using uh, these giant numeral vesicles I mentioned at the beginning. So it's just single compartment, but they're base and aqueous. And so the method we use it is a emulsion phase transfer where you make droplets in an oil containing lipid, very similar, uh, much smaller though, more cell size. You then centrifuge these through an oil aqueous interface, which contains a monolayer of lipid as well. And so what then happens is if you get all the conditions right, you then form giant amount of vesicles of, a, of roughly cell size on the other side. So this is work uh, from one of my students, Jefferson Smith. Uh, and so what he managed to do is generate synthetic cells containing light out DNA, uh, cell free expression system. So here you can see if you don't, you can see that each of these synthetic cells contains 
a Texas red dextran to, so you can see them. And without light, and without DNA, you don't get any expression of here an, an encoded M, M neon green protein. If you have amine DNA, which is just the, the version that had been photo, that would be photocleaved, you then just start generating, you start having expression inside the synthetic cells. Whereas if you have the light DNA, without light, you get no expression in the synthetic cells. Whereas if you then shine light on them, then you get similar expression to what you'd have with the amine DNA. This is just showing the first example that we can light activate the expression within synthetic cells with this technology. So now obviously what you can do with light as before is you can pattern. So what Jeff did is he uh, enclosed the synthetic cells within agarose so they wouldn't move and then put a photo mask over the top and shine light over through the photo mask. And so you can generate all sorts of different shapes. So here's just nice line patterns you can see. You can see the really nice uh, distinction of, the, of where the photo mask was from the, from the light shining on it. You can also obviously generate uh, more complicated structures which have concept like this concentric circle, right? And so here you have uh, not straight, but a curved line interface between the, these are regions. And what's really nice here is you can see that it's got really good resolution, even though this isn't uh, a smooth a smooth object, right? These snake cells are uh, a specific uh, specific uh, regions of it within the within there within the, the region of being illuminated. And you can obviously then generate all sorts of different st structures here as so a set a set of uh, a set of cards. Uh, which again, you can see quite well uh, with all the resolution of the different regions. We didn't want to just light activate snake cells. We wanted to have them communicate with living cells. And so what we, uh, what Jeff chose to do really was to work with, with quorum sensing, in, which is a bacterial cell to cell communication mechanism. So in quorum sensing, it's used as a population control uh, by altered action of a gene expression at, when they're at high cell density. And it's, 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 it's uh, in living systems, it's used to control things like virulence and biofilm formation and, and bioluminous, amongst other things. What's also the case is it's actually been used a number of times for communication between synthetic cells and bacteria, uh, which showed us that it, would, it should definitely work. Uh, and, and the way it works is you have a, a regulator protein which binds to a small molecule called a homocerolactone, which then uh, allows the expression of a synthetase for that small molecule. And then those are membrane permeable small molecules. So you just get, uh, uh, again, the, the autoinduction of gene expression when you have a high cell density. So this is, this is the way we, we, we managed to do this. So we looked at doing uh, communication between snake cells and E. coli based on uh, this BJI, BJR uh, quorum sensing pair. The reason we chose this one uh, was, was a number, a number of different reasons. One, it hadn't been done before. Uh, all the other method, all the other quorum sensing between bacteria uh, and synthetic cell had been using very uh, standard enzymes uh, and using linear chains, which were not uh, orthogonal to each other. So we wanted to generate a new method that people could use, which would work with the previous methods to allow it to be orthogonal to generate multi-switches for different bacteria. And so Jeff actually had to go undergo a bit of evolution on the BJR to get this to be uh, really nice and tight in cell-free systems, which he's done, which I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, and, and thanks to Professor Kamala Haynes for the, the BJR reporter plasmid. Uh, and one other really nice thing about BJR, BJI, is the BJI uh, actually uses the CoA as the substrate to make the homocerolactone. So most other proteins, most other synthetases uh, use an acyl carrier protein which you have to make. Whereas here, actually, this is commercially available. So it means that this, all, all, this is all really easy to, to actually do and, and to anyone to do. And so you just need the, the DNA for the synthetase, the SAM, and the IV-CoA, and you can generate the homocerolactone. 
And so what this would then do is we'd then do the, the DNA for the BGI synthetase in Synthetic Cell. I'd activate with the SAM IV CoA, which are membrane impermeable, and then generate this membrane permeable homocerolactone, which would then go into a bacteria with a reporting plasmid containing the BJR uh, and a promoter for a green fluorescent protein to show that we've actually activated. And so I think this is really interesting for future applications, because this is the idea of remotely initiating bacterial responses without having to genetically engineer any bacteria, right? So you could think of controlling bacteria in space without having to do anything to the bacteria. So how well does this work? Uh, quite well. So Jeff, first thing he did was to generate synthetic cells and uh, shine a light on them and then take the media from them and put them on these reporter cells. And so here you can see that without DNA in the snake cells, you don't get any fluorescent back output. With the DNA, but with the A cell SAM on the outside, in case the proteins uh, uh, burst, in case the snake cells are bursting and just doing things on the outside, you don't get anything. And with the light of DNA, if you don't shine light, you get exactly the same and no output from the bacteria. But with light, you get a really good signal. So it shows that the signal molecules are only synthesized and released following that activation. But obviously these are separate. So what we wanted to do really is have them all together. And so what Jeff managed to do is to again, put these snake cells in agros and grow bacteria on top of them. And so in this case, what you can do is you can then see that uh, if we're just in, the, in these ones, we're just measuring the bacteria, just imaging the bacteria. So without DNA, you don't get any expression inside the bacteria. With the DNA, BGI DNA, but without light, you don't get any expression. But as soon as you shine a light on this system, then the molecule synthesized and then goes into the bacteria and activates expression. And here you can see these mini colonies that are being, uh, being expressed and you can see the snake cells are still stable after the, the end of the experiment. So this is just showing that we can actually trigger remotely the, uh, the communication between synthetic matter and living matter. So I wanna switch gears a little bit uh, and talk about, talk a bit about, a bit more the chemistry side. Uh, so this is uh, the idea that we don't really want to be working in UV and ultraviolet, right? So uh, this, these, these two graphs kind of show the same thing, but in the reverse. So this is the absorption of tissue, a different wavelength. So you can see lower than 400, you have a really high absorption. And so you get very little, this is shows the tissue penetration of light. But as soon as you start moving into blue and then red and in near infrared, you start to get much higher, much higher uh, tissue penetration. So this is actually starts to become physiologically useful for, for things. People have used uh, red and near infrared light to activate things in mice. So for future use with snake cells and, uh, and cell-free systems, we want to be using longer wavelengths of light in the future. And so my, my student, Dennis uh, Hartman, so one of the things he's been working on uh, is this exact problem. And so he's been generating blue light activated DNA. So using this photocleavable humerin, which, which cleaves in the blue light. So in this case, you can see very similar to the previous molecule I showed. We have a biotin attached. Uh, and this, this moiety here, you don't need to worry about it. It just allows reaction with the amines on the DNA. So here you can see the, the spectra. So you've got a really good signal in the blue. And so we've been using a uh, 455 uh, through all the experiments to, to illuminate this with. Uh, and one thing that it's worth noting because it's gonna come up is that it's got very minimal absorbance in the UV, right? Which, is, which, which will end up being very useful. So first thing, we, he made the DNA just as I previously showed. So we've got now uh, this T7 promoter with seven streptavidins on it. But what he did is he, he'd annealed this, sorry, before the strep is ready, he annealed it to short DNA strands that encode the RNA aptima sequence from broccoli. So this way you can just have these three sequences, three DNA, you can, you can kneel them together. And you can then look at the RNA that's produced on a gel. And so if you just have the amine, uh, for the, as in the cleave product, you get a nice band for the RNA that's been transcribed. But with the blue light of DNA, if you have no light, then you don't get any aptima being produced. Whereas if you shine blue light, you then get this aptima being produced again. So you get this really tight off state and a really great on state again, as I showed before. 
Uh, we were a little confused when we looked at the fluorescents, but it, it made sense after a while. So the amine DNA, again, you get a really good signal from the broccoli aptima, uh, very good, uh, really nice aptima to use to work with. And again, with no DNA, you get very little signal. But with our blue DNA, we were getting a good signal without light. A uh, little confused for a little while until we realized the coumarin molecule we were using is actually very fluorescent. Uh, actually fluorescent in the region that broccoli is fluorescent. So a little frustrating, but we can see that actually what all this means is that this is the baseline. And then when we shine blue light, we then get a really good signal. Right? So again, you can see this, uh, this on is similar to this on here. So you can see the tight control of transcription, blue light now. So we did the same uh, in terms of with M Venus now for protein expression. So he made uh, with PCR the same construct that contained M Venus with the promoter. And here you can see uh, with amine DNA, uh, you have a thousand base pair product. And with blue DNA now with the stripped avidin, you again increase the size. If you shine blue light, it then goes back to the original. But what's great here is if you shine UV light, it doesn't move. Right, so this shows that it should be orthogonal. And so when we did the fluorescence is exactly what we saw. So with, with the amine DNA, we got a good expression with, with or without blue light. And with no DNA, we got very little. Uh, with blue DNA, we get a very good off state, a really great on state with blue, and we still get a good off state with UV. And with UV DNA, light of DNA, we get a good off state with both uh, no light and blue light, and a good off state a good on state with UV light. So this just shows that we're getting both tight and orthogonal control of protein synthesis with two different wavelengths of light. And so what this allows us to do is to start doing really interesting cell-free things. So things like making logic gates. So here we were making now the first dual wavelength uh, cell-free AND gate, right? So here what we used is the split beta galactosidase so this has just two different parts which come together to form uh, functional beta galactosidase So we encoded one part in the blue DNA and one part in the UV DNA. And so what you can see is with just UV, just blue or no light, you get a really good off state. And then when you shine light in either order, blue, UV or UV blue, you then get a really good on state similar to uh, the amine only DNA. So you just get this nice uh, AND gate and this is really, I think, the, the first step towards controlling really complex biological process using just light. Uh, so uh, Razia, uh, uh, another student in my group, and Dennis then put this together and gave me some data last week uh, to show that you can do this also in, in synthetic cells, so with blue now instead of UV. So again, so the same, the same thing as the previously, you have this light of a DNA, blue light of a DNA, self expression system containing M neon green DNA. So without DNA, you don't get any uh, expression. You just take, you can just see the synthetic cells in, in, in purple. The Amy DNA, you start to get a good expression. But with blue light DNA, without light, you get no expression. But then when you shine blue light, you then get this expression. So we're just really starting to show that you can use light in all sorts of different ways to control cell free. Uh, cell-free systems and, uh, and snake cells. So just, uh, just to finish on, I want to uh, uh, tempt you with something else that I'm not going to explain too much, some, some new work in the group, which is generating light activated DNA, pl the plasmid DNA. Right, so plasmids are really interesting, right? Because everyone uses them for everything and they're really useful in cell-free uh, systems because they don't degrade as much because you don't have the ends. Uh, and so what, what COA has been doing uh, is been trying to make light out to do plasmids. Uh, we're not going to say exactly how it's done, but it's in a, in a very similar way, so similar manner. Uh, and the nice thing about plasmids is it's not just applicable for cell-free systems, right? These are many potential applications biologically and medically in the future. And so what he's managed to show again with cell-free expression is with just an amine plasmid, or just putting biotins on there, you still get good expression. But making it light activated, you then get a really good off state and a really good on state to activate expression. So uh, to, to summarize, we've generated orthogonal UV blue light-activated DNA. We've generated light-activated plasmids. 
Uh, we've generated these dual light activated cell free logic gates uh, and we've shown remote control of communication between synthetic cells and living cells. And so light is just one of the things we're working on, working on all sorts of other things as well. Uh, and, and one thing I really hope you'll take from this uh, is that chemistry is really vital for synthetic cells and synthetic biology for any future applications. Uh, so to finish that, I'd like to thank my group, uh, especially the people whose work I presented, collaborators, uh, Oxford and UCL, uh, and all the funding. And for anyone listening, thanks a lot. Happy oh my safety. God, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Amazing talk. So uh, let me ask uh, people uh, ask question by typing or you know, let me know whether uh, you want to speak. Actually, the more actually have another meeting, unfortunately, so he left during your talk. Uh, any question from audience? Otherwise, I will start one question while waiting. Let me check your Q&A. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll start. So uh, the key question is uh, uh, UV generally damage uh, you know, DNA itself. So have you seen any serious problem or have you done some sequencing uh, to confirm the safety of the UV? I was wondering. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. It's, it's an important question. Uh, I would say people overstate the problem of UV. Uh, it's, it's used quite a lot. People like Dirk Trowney use it all the time in biological mm -hmm. systems to control his azobenzene molecules. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the advantage here is we're only using it once. We don't have to use it multiple times as well because we're just activating. Uh, we, we, we do look at the amount of damage in a cell-free system. We're normally working before that to that, uh, that point. Uh, and we don't see any degradation of DNA. Okay, but do you see any mutation of DNA? Uh, DNA? I mean, uh, have you kind of done some sequencing uh, to check? Yeah, no, we, we, need, we need to do, you're, you're right, especially, especially in working more with living cells. We uh -huh. need to start doing some more, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say sequencing, but at least more damage studies uh, to look. But the but viability-wise, the viability isn't changed. Uh, both mammalian cells and, and bacteria cells. It's more if there's uh, smaller problems going on. I see. Also, uh, of course, I mean, in using visible light is inconvenient because experiments should be done in the dark you know, space. But would you, I mean, would it be another chemistry way, I mean, uh, to use visible wavelengths such as longer than 400 nanometer? Uh, than UV? I mean, is it any chemistry? I kind of remember some course, I mean, I took, I mean, a long time ago, but you know, probably the, that's the 30 years ago. So I, now probably there are more, you know, better way. I mean, I mean, I don't know. I mean, just, you are premise, you know, experts. I'm not, so. Yeah, no, so I, I would say uh, it's interesting. Quite, it's an interesting point, right? Because you're, you're right. You, you can't work under light as easily, right? But it, it also depends on the power of the light. Uh -huh. Right, so it's the case that you can work under some light. Uh, it's more about how much light you work under, right? And so it's like we, we managed to do it. Obviously, yeah, we, we we have worked with blue, and we're working with with green and with longer now as well. Uh, so like you you can do these things. People have made uh, photo cages that work into the into the near infrared, right? And, and it's just it's just about the case of uh, of how much light you use. And, and ambient light and how long you leave things under ambient light because it's, it's not the case that you do leave things under ambient light in experiments anyway often i see thank you thank you uh let me check uh there is the let me see uh oh i see the question from justin could you discuss uh, how magnetic or ultrasound responsive DNA could be used in vivo? Do you have idea related to the gut microbiome? Interesting question. Yeah, no, so we, yeah, we, we do. We are working on temperature ultrasound and magnetic DNA as well. Uh, I, I'm not gonna tell you how, but I can tell you how it might be used, right? So ultrasound is obviously, uh, an excellent stimulus, right? Because it gets great spatial precision. It's even more biocompatible than bioorthogonal. Uh, you get great tissue penetration compared to light. Uh, and magnetism, 
pretty much the same. Uh, you don't get as great spatial precision with some of the instruments that are out now, but you get great uh, orthogonality, you get great tissue penetration. And so there are two stimuluses we're really excited about because of the fact that you can then start to do things much more in vivo. And yeah, we're looking at all sorts of interesting applications and we're hoping, people, we're hoping we can start working with people to do things like working on the gut microbiome. Okay, thank you. So I guess that answer Justin's question. Uh, any other question? Let me check. Uh, no. Okay, okay. Let me ask one more question. Uh, challenging question. So synthetic cell, you know, the idea being uh, probably more than a decade, uh, you know, but still very challenging, probably one of the most challenging kind of uh, question or problem, I believe, in synthetic biology. So because, I mean, this is uh, living system is so complex. I mean, you know, you know, signal, you know, you know, signaling and also we need to have the membrane and then it, that need to evolve and also you know the cells should be replicate and every single thing I mean that everything single thing and should be uh, addressed so what would be the most challenging uh, you know aspect to make the synthetic cell uh, you know in the, what should be done I mean in near in, in next decade I mean to make that happen. Can you kind of share your idea? No, it's a good question. I think it depends on your application. So uh -huh. for, for instance, if you're going to trying to actually make a minimal synthetic cell that you can build that does everything that a living cell can do, uh -huh. I would say there's a lot you need to do, uh -huh. right? There's Because again, you know, if, if we're talking about the, 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 the Ventnor uh, uh, example, uh -huh. uh, the, you know, the, their latest one, right, was... I think it was like four or 500 genes and 150 of them, they didn't even know what they did yet. Uh -huh. Right. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly complex. Uh -huh. uh, what, what I would say is, is if you're, and if you're building them up, right, there's, you don't even know what you need to build up uh -huh. to, 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 you know, to generate, to generate the, the, the actual living cell. Uh, I would say that's not what I focused on. Because uh -huh. uh, I think that there, there's other steps and other things you can use them for. Right. If you want to actually use them, for instance, to study how living cells work, real living cells, right? You can use them as I as I gave the example, right? If we if we can use these to study bacteria in biofilms without having to genetically modify the bacteria, right? Mm -hmm. We can study them spatial temporary resolution to activate and control the bacteria, for instance. Uh, and again, you know, applications in, in gut microbiome uh, area. If we can use them to actually as as biotherapeutics in vivo, right? To activate with you know ultrasound and magnetism to actually generate uh, to target cancer, for instance, right? So they can uh, you know, actually activate and not have to modify anything, not have to even have any active species in your active ingredient, right? If you can generate a therapeutic protein in situ where you need it, right? Then you don't have any off-target toxicity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely, you know, fantastic points. In that case, I mean, you are you know, a nicer person than me because I'm using, you know, real living cell. Uh, and then at the end of the day, for the biocontainment purpose, I kill them and kill billions of different bacteria until now, I guess, but you never you know, worry about killing living cell, right? At the end of I mean, the day. I mean that's, another, that's another point, right? Is that with synthetic biology, there's always the, the 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 biocontainment aspect uh -huh. right of, of li using living cells to target other living cells right. you never know what's going to happen right? right and there's always there's always the, the ethical aspect of that whereas right. with snake cells i don't they're not going to replicate and i don't want them to replicate right right so you completely exactly. remove that problem exactly uh, but still have the ability of synthesizing proteins making new things in situ Right, 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 right. So I'm, I, I, you know, we, we are developing my lab developing the you know, kill switch, and I'm the enemy of the all the bacteria because I'm trying to kill them. So, <laughs> so that's my point actually. Okay, uh, let me check one more time. Uh, any uh, other question? Okay, okay, good. Uh, so let me close. So thank you, uh, for joining us and staying today. Although. Imperial College London actually hosting 
now another great virtual meeting uh, called AI for Symbio with currently actually, you know, Jim Collin uh, talking. And I also attended the first one hour part before the seminar. And, and that was the interesting AI uh, aspect of synthetic biology. And we will meet again next week on March 3rd, 4th, uh, uh, 31, Thursday, the same time, the same Zoom link. We'll have finally Professor Kristalla Prather at MIT, my PhD advisor, and the best advisor. I'm not talking about one of the best advisors, but the best advisor in the world, and the Professor Pierangelo Goba, Gobo, another brand new assistant professor at University of Trieste in Italy. And I may visit Italy for a conference in May. Uh, and I'm looking forward to you know, uh, listening to both of the, their talk. Uh, and as usual, the follow informal chat will occur without recording. And so please stay here if you are interested in chatting with today's speaker and me. And I will uh, promote you to panelists who can speak and show your handsome and pretty face. So thank you so much. I will stop recording. Let me stop.